further ado, Mike, and I think you're up. Well, thank you very much, and thank all of you for uh, coming and giving us an opportunity to test our ideas on, on all of you. I want to thank FBA and Dame Sackler and my colleagues for, uh, you know, in your case, putting the program together and us having the opportunity to exchange views with ourselves and you as well. So I couldn't be more pleased to, to be here. I think if I would leave you with a takeaway point, and I'm, I'm basically an optimistic person, but I also try to be realistic, and I'm afraid I'm leaning in the direction of realism uh, here at, at this particular uh, era. I think, put it bluntly, we are sleepwalking into a potential high level of conflict with China. Over what time frame, how fast, is certainly not predetermined, but that's the trajectory we're on. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, as citizens and uh, intellectuals, we ought to be thinking of all the ways we can change that trajectory and make it more positive because, as Julia said, the, the world is really depending on us to manage this relationship. And by us, I mean Americans and Chinese. And while I might comment more on American policy sometimes than Chinese, I think China has no less responsibility than us and no more blame than us for the current condition of the relationship. Uh, I think how unparalleled the situation is is simply if you contemplate the fact that two nuclear powers have never had a kinetic conflict. We came very close to that in October of 1962. But when we start talking about missiles hitting Guam or striking deep into China with missiles, you are talking about a conflict between two nuclear powers, and that has not happened. I don't think the American consciousness is quite caught up with the reality of, of the capabilities that we both uh, have. Also, I would just uh, sort of have a definitional statement of the situation. If you look at a, the sort of 50 years of uh, since Nixon, I would say a good chunk of that period, 40 years, was what I would, our policy was reassuring each other that we would make space in the international system and gradually improve relations over time. It was reassurance was our policy. We, in the last 10, 12 years, have changed, and that by we, I mean China and the U.S., to a policy of deterrence. And deterrence is about threat, whether it's economic, diplomatic, uh, or obviously uh, military. The, the very root of our respective policies uh, is, has a different objective. No longer reassurance, but in fact deterrence through threat. Now what I'd like to do just to get the discussion going and sort of make a broad umbrella is make three points and they all deserve discussion. I will make them a little more sharply than even I would after we take off the rough edges. But for the sake of clarity, let me make three points. First of all, I think our traditional relationship since Nixon and it evolved over all the intervening administrations till Trump was sort of a three-legged stool. It was a tripod, and that tripod was, uh, uh, we uh, were strategic interests, uh, military balance, uh, the Soviet Union and our attempt to deter the Soviet Union played a big role, but it was a military dimension of the relationship, and we sold weapons and transferred intelligence, and it was a very co increasingly complex relationship. The second uh, leg on this tripod was economic, and that grew over time, particularly after China joined the WTO in 2001. And then there was the diplomatic uh, leg, and cultural and educational, and that drew, uh, grew enormously. We were talking about the, the, uh, the museum in, in Beijing. I was talking about Hopkins Nanjing Center for 36 years we've run in Nanjing. There were huge investments in the uh, education and cultural domain that I think were good for everybody, just to not put too fine a point on it. 
But the point is that that three-legged stool, every leg in the stool is becoming weaker. And as one becomes weaker, it makes the other weaker. Let me just make an example. As our strategic relationship becomes more distrustful, of course, we slap on uh, export controls. We slap on investment controls. That weakens the economic relationship. Also, we, uh, the federal government, uh, in an exercise of its due responsibilities, has to become more mindful of what Chinese students are doing in American laboratories on universities. And so it begins to affect the educational relationship. So my first point is, this is a comprehensive deterioration of the U.S.-China relationship, and one piece of the process affects the other. My second point is, and it gets to the more post, or the whole Ukraine and everything that that stands for, uh, there's been, a, I would say, an acceleration in the deterioration of our relationship in this period of, we'll call it the Ukraine war. And uh, let me just indicate the, some of the dimensions. On February 4th of this year, in uh, Beijing, Putin uh, met with Xi, went to the uh, Winter Olympics, uh, one of the relatively few major world leaders who did so, uh, and they issued a joint statement. And the operative parts, I invite you to go read it, but the operative phrases that uh, I think are important is, it proclaimed a no limits partnership and even more significant than that it says there are no forbidden areas of cooperation between Russia and China uh, and this was just on the eve well uh, 20 days before the Russian invasion of Ukraine and so it raises the issue of what Xi Jinping knew. Did he give a green light, so to speak? He was quite concerned that there not be an invasion of Ukraine by Russia while he's trying to conduct the, uh, the Olympic Games. He, he obviously achieved that objective. But it looks as though he certainly didn't try to dissuade, if it was dissuadable, uh, Mr. Putin. But the point is, there was this document and joint statement. That's the, the, the core point. And what is uh, notable about that is once the invasion happened, China did not articulate the policy that has guided it since the early 1950s, which is the inviolability of the sovereignty of nations as recognized by the United Nations. China did not as it is almost in every other case, there are a couple of exceptions, but basically has always, <coughs> sanctity of sovereignty has been the key point. Well, uh, that's the basis of the international system as we know it today. So it raises, its, 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 uh, raises the issue about the commitment of China to the, the fundamental principle of the international system. And my point, is that this greatly affected in a very negative way the view of the Biden, and I'm not limited perhaps to the Biden administration, but had a deep scarring effect on the Biden administration. And that gets me to my third point, which is, it was mentioned by Julia briefly, was the Blinken speech, Secretary of State Blinken speech that was, I think, a summary, so to speak, of the reevaluation of China policy in the new administration. He delivered that speech on May 26th. I encourage you all to go and read that speech. Uh, obviously, a lot of work and thought went into it. I'm not diminishing it. But what I would like to call your attention to about that speech is that it is very much like a very famous document in April, April 14th, 1950, which was called NSC 68, National Security Council Policy Papers, drawn up by Paul Nitze. But it basically was the roadmap for the U.S. waging of the Cold War and containment. Truman adopted it as the administration policy. Then the Korean War broke out, and this became the roadmap. The only point I want to leave you with at this moment is Blinken's speech 
has remarkable parallelism in both content and structure to that earlier document. So you asked, are we headed for Cold War Redux? I'd say if you look at these two documents, you'd have to say, uh, that's a possibility uh, here. And what are some of the, uh, and I'll just wind up with this because I want to hear my colleagues, uh, what are some of these, these parallels? Well, first of all, uh, sets the goal that China, now China sort of substituted for the USSR in this latter document, but states the goal that we can't permit, in effect, Eurasia to be dominated by China. If you go to the earlier document, it stated the goal of not allowing Eurasia to be dominated by the Soviet Union and also implied uh, China. Secondly, it, the, the uh, earlier document set the goal, uh, uh, an ideological goal. That is to say, now we're talking about democracy defeating authoritarianism is sort of the ideological. That earlier document set democracy versus communism. But the point is it had a very strong ideological goal in, I would say, both documents. Uh, if you talk about military threat, this current speech by Blinken talks about China is the pacing military challenge facing the U.S. military. If you uh, talk about uh, why is it that we are concerned about Chinese foreign policy, and if you look at that earlier document, why we were concerned about the Soviet Union, because they didn't observe international norms and precepts. And that s similar phraseology is used in the uh, Blinken speech. If you look at the two documents, a great emphasis placed on the allies and them increasing their defense spending. And we're all in it together kind of thing. And also the doc, both documents have placed great emphasis on controlling strategic technologies, resources, and in effect out-competing uh, the Soviet Union in technology and of course economics. So what I'm really trying to say is go back and look at the origins of the Cold War in its sort of uh, initial uh, statement and look at the current secretary's speech and you're going to be, I believe you will be struck by the parallelism. Now that does not mean, and this will be my last thought, does not mean that we're necessarily wrong. We, we could debate that, meaning the U.S. It doesn't mean we've misstated things. But I always remember back what uh, uh, George Kennan, the father of containment in the theory said. He said, I laid out what I thought was a diplomatic strategy and it became a military strategy. And so the last similarity in Blinken's speech with, uh, was essentially he said, this is a diplomatic strategy. That got, my, that got my attention. So thank you very much and I look forward to the discussion of my time.